Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is where we find our textual environment today. And there are some other verses that will come later on in this teaching. I want us to read those verses together. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let's go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world even unto the end of the world. Today I'm teaching on racing the rapture. Look at somebody and tell them, we are racing the rapture. We'll, we'll put it a little stronger than that. Tell them, we have to, we have to race the rapture. Because that day is coming. It's, it's not changing. God is not pushing it back when he looks around and says, well, maybe we should. No, that date is set. No man knows the day nor the hour, but it is set. So the job that we have to do, which is to get people into the kingdom of God, must be done as quickly and expeditiously as efficiently and effectively as possible. We're racing the rapture. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. We honor you and we bless your name. We come today and as we have worshiped, we felt your presence. And yet it's more than a feeling. It's a knowing. We know that you are in this place today. Yes, God. And so we ask you now to open our minds and our hearts and our spirits to receive this teaching as we race the rapture to complete the job, the assignment, the ministry that you have put, the ministry of reconciliation into our hands. We thank you now. Speak to our hearts and open our ears and our minds in Jesus name. And everyone said amen. You may be seated. You know, before we get in the actual teaching, it's, it's interesting as we uh, announce and bless Minister Roger and Evangelist Laurel Brooks Sutherland. Uh, it came back to me, and it's something that my father used to say very frequently. Many of you will remember. The church is like a train. And do you know why? Can, can we roll that video, Brother Shamar? Is it possible? I don't know if you have it. But the church is like a train. Church is always picking up passengers. And while it is picking up passengers, can we turn down the volume a bit? While it is picking up passengers, it is letting off. So you can cut the volume if possible. We don't need the audio, just the video. It's it's picking up passengers and letting off some at the same time and so when you're going on a train especially in new york or wherever that subway uh, you you have to wait until those who are coming off you have to give you can't go in until they come off that's just a culture and the practice because they need space to get off then you can get in and the church has always been like that people come in and people go 
And we're not even talking go as in leave the church, but it's just the way it is. Uh, I mean, this congregation, if we should call some names from Hewa Circle, some of you will not even have a clue who we're talking about. They have migrated or they have transitioned, but that's just the reality. That's just the reality. So we saw Minister Roger and Evangelist Brooks transition into another country and we wish them Godspeed. Thank you, Shemar. We wish them Godspeed, that God will go with them, that God will open doors for them and that wherever they go, as we said, they will be fruitful in ministry. Amen. I do pray and trust that all the Emmanuelites that have migrated, some of you may be watching, that you have not gone to a place where you're just dormant and not being involved. Amen. If the church you're going needs a letter from us to verify that you were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, please let us know. We'll be happy to send that letter, but it's not for you to get lost in a crowd. Amen. And just sit there and be unemployed in the kingdom of God. You know, we've said it here. We've, we've said it once. We've said it a million times. There is no room in this church, this assembly, or the church of the living God for unemployed members. And we're not talking about your nine to five job. We're talking about being unemployed in the kingdom of God. There's too much to be done. There are too many responsibilities. There are too many roles that you can play for you to be in the church. And what it means to you is coming here on Sundays, warming the chairs. It's a little harder now with the AC, but still, trust me, you can still warm these chairs even in an air-conditioned room. It's more than that. When you come and you go, you come and go on purpose. You come here and you go charged up, filled up, revived, ready to take on hell and take on every demon and go for those that need God and show them the way. Amen? You see, you see the church is like uh, a bridge connecting two lands and that's what bridges do it go usually over water or over a deep precipice and and uh, people are here and on land and they want to get over there to that other side the bridge is Jesus Christ that connects the two lands with people who need to get from darkness into light and as Jesus is the bridge. Guess who are the tour guides who are saying, come this way, come this way. Who, 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 who are the guides? Look at your neighbor and tell them, you are. You are. It is your responsibility to get people across the bridge of Jesus. The bridge that Jesus is. It is our responsibility to get people across so they can have a relationship with Father God. And we are ready. We are able. We have been empowered. There is nothing that can stop us apart from fear. The devil can make you fear and feel afraid. But we've come to mash down that today. And we have been doing that. And we will continue to do it because we are racing the rapture. I think I preached a message by the title, maybe in the 70s, maybe one of my first uh, messages, and it was also a theme for, I don't know if it was a convention or a youth week or whatever. Anybody remember that? Racing the rapture. Nobody remembers. It's a whole different congregation. Uh, I must have been here a long time. But, <laughs> but, but you see, when you look at this verse in Matthew 28, if we should seek to exegete the text, and I'm teaching, I'm teaching. So be patient, follow along, get your pens and your notepads out, 
get your phones and your Samsung notes or those who aren't blessed with Samsungs, if you have an iPhone, go ahead, pull it out too. And take some notes. Take some notes. It's important. But first of all, the Bible says, go ye, what? Go ye, therefore. Now, that word, therefore, whenever you see it in Scripture, you must ask yourself what? What must you ask yourself when you see therefore in a verse? What is it there for? Get it? So go ye therefore. Why does therefore come up here? What does it mean? Because the, the, the chapter doesn't start at 19. This is verse 19. That means it has 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, right back to 1. And what had Jesus just declared before he said, go ye there. You can look, you can look. Go in your basket. I tell you, have your sword. It's not on the screen. But before verse 19, what happened? Come on, we're in class this morning. What happened? What did he say? He came unto them and said, All power is given unto me. In other words, all authority. Authority, power and authority would be synonymous there in this context. Sometimes they're different, right? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And what next? Go ye therefore. So the therefore is there for the reason... To remind us that we are going in his authority. All power is given unto me. Therefore go in my authority. Go in my name. Go and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20 says, teaching them to observe. Now I've always said and I'd like to say again that that first teach in verse 19 go ye therefore and teach all nations comes from the greek word didasco that teach means not so much to impart the knowledge yet but to group them up register them enroll them gather them go ye therefore and bring them in in preparation to really impart to them. It is the next teaching now, is the next word teaching in verse 20. If you flip to verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe all things. Now, this teaching comes from a different Greek word. It comes from the Greek word mathetio. And mathetio is the word that really now speaks to teaching, imparting. You know, create lessons. Create. So the first teach is to create the learning environment. To bring them together. Sit them down. Make sure they have whatever implements and tools they need. But in verse 20 now, it says, now is when you're going to teach them to observe all that I have, what? Commanded you. And he says, and lo, I am with you always. So then, Back to 19, go. You see, sometimes we read these verses and we just go, vrrr, especially when we know them. For God so loved the word that he gave. And you're not even, the Lord is my shepherd. I... Go. Everybody say go. Again from the Greek, and I'm not going to, not, I'm not a scholar of Greek. I'm not pretending. It's all Greek to me. I really don't understand much. But, but, but it's important sometimes to check a word and even to understand the etymology, the root meaning of the word. Stay with me. Stay with me. Go assumes that you, it is, it is saying as you go, it assumes that you are already going. So it's not just when you come to church. It's not just when you go on an evangelistic endeavor. But as you go, 
Remember, these, these guys were fishermen. They were carpenters. They had regular occupations. So when Jesus said to them, Go ye therefore, the Greek word that was used for that implies, As you go, teach all nations. Now, what does that mean for us? It means you don't have to be in an evangelistic club. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be any of that. But as you go to work tomorrow, come on, as you go to school this week, as you go overseas weekend, as you go, in verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations. In other words, this message is for nations. Somebody say nations. And yes, there are many churches and many ministries all over the world. So Emmanuel Slipe Road is not committed to reaching every nook and cranny, every auntie and granny everywhere you can find them. No. Uh, that's why the church is universal. But in our space, as far as we can influence individuals, we have a commitment. We have a mandate. Because Matthew 28, 19, and 20 has been called what? Come on, church. Matthew 20, I heard it here, don't repeat it. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 has been called what? Everybody say, the great, I can't hear you, say the great commission. Now, it's not the great option, <laughs> which means you don't have no choice. It's not, it's not an option, it's a mandate. Jesus himself gave us the mandate that we must go, that we must spread the word, that we must tell everybody. You ever get a message on WhatsApp or some social media platform and at the end they say, share, 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 share with everybody. Send it. And, and some of them are crazy like, if you send it to 20 people, you're going to be blessed. You're going to get a new car. The devil is a liar. I don't waste your time. Don't waste your time with that junk. Amen. Praise God. They, they just, they're just looking for hits and getting more likes and more people to be connected to them. But, but we have been told to share by Jesus Christ himself. So how can we do anything less? How can we not be in obedience to the commandment that was given by God? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And again, the nation of Jamaica is our primary target. But because of technology and because, you know, we travel and the world is becoming a real small global village, we can, we can influence Jamaica and impact the world because we have the facilities. We have the technology. And you never know how God can use this ministry to touch somebody in Timbuktu, to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost in New Zealand. It's possible. It is happening. It will happen. I speak it and I declare it in the name of Jesus. But don't pray and ask God to send you to China as a missionary when you don't witness to your neighbor. Why should he? You know Chinese? You know Mandarin? You're going to have to go learn it. But your neighbor is right there that speak the same patwa, speak the same English, and you don't even talk to them. We don't even say good morning. <laughs> but Lord, I want to go to be a missionary in India. Send me to Pakistan. Yes? Why you don't ask him to send you to Russia? Come on, beloved. We must tell everybody we meet about the love of Jesus Christ. It's not an option. It is something we must do. So then, the main point in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is what? 
What is the main point in Matthew 20, in the Great Commission? What is the main point? What is the thesis statement? What, what is it? Go, yes, but you're going for a purpose. So what is the main purpose of going? Yes? Yes? I hear it down here. What is it? Witness. What must be the result of your witnessing? To make Thank you. Make disciples. You don't go to the bakery just to go to the bakery. If you are the baker. <laughs> See what I'm saying? If you are a chef, you don't just go to the kitchen. But you, if you're going to fulfill a purpose in the kitchen, you have to go in the kitchen. So we don't just go because he said go. But we're going on purpose. And the purpose is to make disciples of all men. Now I have a question for you. If, if, if a billionaire came and set up a shoe factory and said, there's no shoe factory in Jamaica. Bata, gone long time. You rem who remembers Bata? Again, I'm telling my age. <laughs> Look around for anybody that raised their hand. You know they're over 50. Well, well, you, you, you don't have to be over 50 to have heard about it. But Bata, B-A-T-A, -A, was the last, I think there may have been others, eh? There could have been others. I don't know if Sam is used to make shoes to a what? Yes? But, huh? Vandel? Yes, yeah, so yeah, you had some, but Bata was the biggest one. Spanish Stone Road Factory. It's been years since they closed down. They may be in other parts of the world. As a matter of fact, they had one of the sweetest, nicest slogans of any business. You know, most businesses have a slogan, a tagline. You know what was Bata's tagline? Yeah, but there was one that just sticks with me, man. It's the best I've ever heard. They're, sell they're making shoes and their slogan, their tagline was two feet Deep in comfort. Oh my God. <laughs> Two feet? That's a whole lot of inches. <laughs> Two feet deep in comfort. But so they're not here. Vandal is not here. Sam is, is still here, but whatever. So a billionaire comes and says, I'm setting up a shoe factory in Jamaica. We're going to bring in the raw material from wherever. And we're going to make shoes. Because it's too expensive to import and da 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 da, what have you? And he employs you as the production manager. Gives you a good salary, gives you good benefits, gives you a car, gives you housing. Everything you need is given. You have no problems. Staff is available, machines are available, material is available. And he says, I'm going away for a year. And this is your job description. And this is what the production must be. This is how many shoes we must manufacture each week, each day, each month. And he goes away and comes back at the end of a year. And you have made zero shoes. What do you expect him to do with you? Fire you? You mean like fire like this fire? Or <laughs> this kind of fire? <laughs> or like Donald Trump, you are fired. Come on. There's no excuse. You had everything. You had material, you had staff, electricity, factory. And you don't produce nothing? You see how quick you were to say fire? Let me ask you another question now. Our father created a similar situation. He said, I am setting this church up and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Upon this rock I build my church. He says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be my witnesses go ye therefore teach all nations make disciples of all men you have everything you need i've committed into your hands 
the gospel of reconciliation. I have given you the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, gentleness, all of that you have at your disposal. Just make disciples. And when he comes back, you have made zero. What should he do with you? Oh, it's very quiet in here now, man. <laughs> I don't hear the same quick response that I heard earlier. <laughs> you don't want to be fired, do you? <laughs> Not at all. But, but why shouldn't he? You're forgetting what he did in Matthew 25. He gave one five talents. He gave the other two. And he gave one one. And he said, go. Go, make the best of this. And I'm going away. And I'm coming back. And when he came back, the one with the five did what? He made five more. He said, you gave me five. Here's five more. Ten. The one with the two said, you gave me two. I made two more. Here is two plus two, four. The one with the one. He was the one that did the big fat zero. And he said, well, I heard about you. And you're a man that you gather where you didn't sow and you reap where you didn't sow. And so I was afraid. You know one of the biggest reasons why believers don't witness? They are afraid. <laughs> they are afraid. They are afraid of rejection. They are afraid that their peers will say, what? In 2024, you are telling me you are a tertiary institution graduate. And you tell me, say, you've got church and you believe in a God and you believe. Yeah. You are afraid to be identified with the fanatics. <laughs> you are afraid to be identified with those who still say that God is real. So the servant said, I was afraid. So I went and dug a hole and buried the talent. What did the master do with him? Come on, you, you can say it now. I know you may talk. What, what, what did he do with him? He fired him. He said, take him and cast him into outer darkness. You wicked and slothful servant. If you knew I was that kind of man, at least you could have taken my talent and put it out to usury and I would have gotten some interest on my investment. So my question to you, beloved, every member sitting here under the sound of my voice, if you have gotten addicted, you know addiction is a crazy thing. Addiction is a terrible thing. And I believe many people in the church have become addicted to fiery sermons. We have become addicted to, to shouting messages. We have become... As a matter of fact, some of you now sitting here like, I want Bishop to go on. Bishop, just preach the word and make me feel good and go on. Because that's what you equate your Christianity with. And I struggle sometimes to come and do what I'm doing because I know people are just like. Right? And when they wake up and it's like. Hallelujah, yes. <laughs> Fast asleep. Because the preacher not burning down the place. Because the preacher not sweating and jumping and, you know. Oh, hello. There's a place for that. But there's a place for this. There's a place for this. There is a place for this. I hear in the Lanny Wolf song, he says, speaking on behalf of Jesus, who said, my house is full. But my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table. The big turkey, the big chicken, the roast beef, the, the rice and peas, the gravy, the scotch bonnet. I mean, we all just want to stay around the table. But no one wants to work. In my field, no one wants to work in my field. And yet, that is the mandate of the church. Go ye therefore, 
now that I have come back from the grave with all power, with all authority, I want you. You are my ambassadors, he said. You are my witnesses. I'm sorry. We have made church into so many things that we have forgotten the main thing. But the main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. Come on somebody, look at your neighbor and tell them the main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. Oh, we can have barbecue suppers, we can have rejoice, we can have this, we can have that, we can do all that we're doing, but the main thing is to make disciples. Disciples. Go ye therefore. That's our mandate. And then, another verse I want to bring to your attention is found in Acts chapter 1. And verse 8. Can we get that on the screen? Uh, if we have time and we will at other points delve into the fullness of Matthew 28. But let's read verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. Let's go. But, come on everybody. But, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost... It's come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Kingston, in Spanish Town, in Manchester, in Montego Bay, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. See, very similar to Matthew 28, 19. That's the essence. Go make disciples. Go make disciples. Beloved, Jesus has no hands except your hands. Look at your hands. Everybody hold up. He has no hands except those that you're looking at. A year hand them him a depend upon to carry the good news. He has no feet. Everybody look at your feet. You don't have to take off your shoes. Just look at your shoes. He has no feet except your feet. He has no voice except your voice. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they believe on him of whom they have not heard? That's what the word says. And how can the preacher preach except he be sent? Let me see all the sent disciples raise your hands. Throw it up high. If you know you are a sent disciple. See, some of you are not raising it because you're not a pastor. You're not a preacher. You're not an evangelist. You have not been ordained. And that's, that's probably one of the worst shackles around the feet of the church. People waiting to be ordained, waiting to be acknowledged. Me now if you acknowledge you. Jesus acknowledged you a long time. Him say, you are my forget what the pastor may or may not do. You have been called, you have been anointed. He said, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. If you have the Holy Ghost, you don't need to come in convention time and wait to be ordained. You are a missionary. Let's put our hands together for the missionary. The devil is a liar. We need to do that. Don't get me wrong. And we will continue to do that. But don't wait for that to happen for you to go and fulfill your God-given responsibility. And let me just say this here. It may not even be the most appropriate time to say it, but there, I take responsibility. There were some names that, that should have been vetted and approved for the last convocation um, thingy, and, and I, I, I blew it. I messed up, and, and so that didn't take place. And even some that were appointed from last two years ago that should have been ordained that were not. 
and some were to be appointed and were not. I, I'm sorry. I take full responsibility for it. We will do it, and we're going to do it in one of our services before convocation next time. But, so I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the body. If you have not been ordained, whether in the last convention or the last 10 years, we must work for Jesus till the shadows fall. Labor for the master and give to him our all in the dewy. In the dewy. Is it season or evening? Whatever. When the reapers reap, we will come rejoicing, bringing in, gathering in, teaching them, enrolling them. My God. And let me remind you, it is not your job to save anybody. We can't save anybody. Paul said, I have planted and Apollos watered. But who gives the increase? Come on. Who gives the increase? It is God who gives the increase. Our job is to be witnesses. We got to tell somebody. Andre Crouch said, tell them even if they don't believe you. Tell them even if they don't receive you. Just tell them for me. Tell them that I love them and I came to let them know. We got to tell them, brethren, even if they don't receive you. I, I said it, many people won't witness because of the fear of rejection. Not many of us can take somebody slamming a door in your face, whether literally or verbally. No, I want to move from me. I want to hypocrite. I want to move. I don't want to hear from the church. No. Tell them. Still tell them. And if, if that's the response, the Bible don't tell you what to do. What did it say? Shake the dust from off your feet, man. And you go looking next. Who can I witness to next? And tell them. If they don't receive you, let me see all the salespeople in here. You sell anything. Insurance, chemicals, whatever. A any salespeople here today? No? Yes, 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 yes. That's, that's what salespeople are trained to do. You think everybody you go to go and buy your insurance policy? You think everybody you go to go and buy your chemicals? You think everybody you go to go and buy whatever you're selling? No. But that doesn't stop you. My unit manager at Mutual Life, which is now Guardian, when we were in training and there was a poster on the, the conference room where we would be in training, it said, you remember? I said it before. Who remember? Timid salesmen have skinny kids. Now nah, make no money. <laughs> <laughs> Can't feed them pick them. Too afraid. You're afraid for to tell people, say, hey, you know, hey, I, I am an agent with uh, Guardian Life, and we have some wonderful policies. I don't know, you may or may not need it, but when would be a good time for us to sit down and just do, you know, just to check this? If you are afraid to do that, you pick them out of dead for hungry. No commissions. And most salespeople work on commissions only. The basic salary, <laughs> might as well have never put a gain of basic salary. If you have a good, strong basic salary, there's not much commissions. And good salesmen want commission. Forget the basic pay. They, they, they could be broke two million dollars in debt today. And by tomorrow, they come out of it. Because they say, I'm getting up tomorrow and I'm going out there. I'm going to face every possible uh, client. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. And when they're done... 
you want to see their check. Timid believers don't bear any fruit in the kingdom of God. And that brings me to another point that I think we have a misconception about. Let me see all those who have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of, come on, don't be afraid. It's not a trick question. I, I'm just going to clarify something. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Hmm? Gentleness, meekness, etc. That is the fruit of the what? So who does that fruit emanate from? Oh, the word emanate kind of. Where does that fruit come from? And according to the verse, use the same word for God that the verse used. Where does that fruit come from? The fruit of the? That's it. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Let me see all those who are the Spirit. Raise your hand. You are not the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. If you are not the Spirit, then that's, it's not you it come from. That's not your fruit. Nobody can generate love, joy, peace by ourselves. It has to be the work of the Spirit. That's what the Bible said. You're with me? Are you in agreement with me? Come on, church. The fruit of the Spirit. It means it's the Spirit that bears these or this fruit. Because really one fruit is not nine fruits. It's one fruit with nine pegs. To be clear, like a tangerine, it's one fruit when you pick it up. But when you peel it, you see different pegs or an orange. It's, it's, it's one fruit. So don't think it's nine fruits. Well, I have five of the nine. That's not too bad. No, you know, if you don't have the nine, you don't have none. <laughs> oh, God help us. You can't have four. And like you do the exam and say, well, I got eight out of ten. That's not, no, no, no. You have to have the nine. The nine pegs. All of them. Hmm? You need to have all of them. And so, if the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, which all of us would say we have, and we do, I'm not challenging you on that. But then, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman, and every branch in me that bears fruit, what happens? He, he, he prunes it, he purges it so that it can bear more fruit. But every branch that does not bear fruit, what happens to it? Cuts it away. Dump it. Get rid of it. Now, here's a question. Which fruit is that talking about? Is that the fruit of the Spirit? Who says it's the fruit of the Spirit? Who says it's not the fruit of the Spirit? Who says I'm not even going to bother answer you, Bishop? <laughs> The fruit of the Spirit is generated by the Spirit. The fruit of the Christian, the fruit of the believer, is not the fruit of the Spirit. And let me give you an illustration. What is the fruit of an orange? Another orange. What is the fruit of a breadfruit? Breadfruit. What is the fruit of bananas? Bananas. What is the fruit of an apple? What is the fruit of a lime? So what is the fruit of a Christian? All right. What is the fruit of a disciple? Another disciple. Thank you. Brethren, 
If you have not seen it this way, I urge you to reconsider your position. In light of everything we have said, go ye therefore and make disciples. In light of everything we have said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And this final verse, and I'm done with today's lesson because we have to understand that when he said you shall receive power, it's because he had a plan. And if you go to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19, then we're going to summarize what we've been saying. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. If we can get that on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. A very powerful verse. Uh, speaks about being reconciled through Jesus Christ. Can somebody nudge the media room? I don't know if they're having difficulty or they're not hearing. But 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. Amen. Who has it? Who has it? Just read it out for me. Verse 19. 2 Corinthians 5. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Hold on now. So God was in Christ reconciling the world and, and that's an accounting term the accountants understand that very well huh yeah reconciling the books reconciling the accounts bringing everything into balance right not imputing their trespasses unto them and have committed into or unto us the word of reconciliation. So God was in Christ doing that. And he did it when he came to Calvary. He went to the cross and he reconciled when he said it is finished. Man's redemption is paid. But now he has given to us or committed into our hands the gospel of reconciliation that's why i said earlier jesus has no feet except your feet he has no hands except your hand he has no mouth except why because he has committed unto us the word this work this ministry of reconciliation is now to be completed by you and me and if we don't do it, you answer that. So I want you to understand that above everything that we do in church, if we are not making disciples of all men in all nations as a global church, Jesus is just not seeing the church in its full glory. I said it earlier and I want to say it again because I believe it's one of our challenges that we have grown into. We want church to be nice and sweet. But the, the shoe factory owner who invested his billions and said make shoes and you don't make shoes. You said he would fire you. So our God who created this world and established this church and said upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. This God who said you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. This God who says 
he was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. But he has now committed into our hands. He has given us the responsibility. He has charged us with the, the job of making disciples. And if we don't do it, it's a rhetorical question. I gave you the example in Matthew 25. The one with the one talent. And some people, some believers say, well, yeah, but they have evangelists, bishop. They have ministers, they have pastors. Let them go preach. Let... Hold it, hold it. Hold it. Matthew 28, 19 is a command and a mandate given to every believer in, in as much as the call to the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes, whosoever is you, 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 whosoever, hmm? you, 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 everybody who, who accepts and embraces John 3, 60, everybody who comes to Christ, whosoever will, let him come in the same way that those verses Include everybody, nobody exempted. It is in the same way and light that Matthew 28 in includes everybody who accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have no exemption. We, we, we can never be exempted. There is no exception. I don't care how shy you are. You must preach the gospel to everybody you can. And use words if necessary. Uh oh. That's a whole nother message. Oh, I'm shy, Bishop. You don't have to say anything. Let the glorious light of Jesus Christ shine through you. That when people see you, you pass them, they're like, Oh, I felt something when she passed me. I, I saw an aura. I just saw a beauty. Because your life is exuding Jesus Christ. The beauty of Jesus is seen in you. And especially in Jamaica, and I close with this, we have to resist this ragamuffin culture that has developed in Jamaica where it comes in the church. My God, you name the name of Christ. Your, your personality has to be beautiful. Even when they crush you. Even when they lie on you. Even when they rub you the wrong way. Come on. It is, a, it is the worst thing for me as a pastor when I give a recommendation of a member of this church or the other church I pastor and then the boss sees me six months later and says, man, that person... Oh my God, we have to get rid of them. They come to work late. They tell you they're not working on Sunday. They tell you they're not doing this. And, and you might be sitting here right now and have that, that kind of mindset. Who, me? Me not working on it. But they told you when you were getting the job that there may come some holidays and some times when you have to work. You can't be a nurse and be talking about you're not working on Sunday. You're not going to hell because you don't come to church one Sunday because you had to work. But you can pray and ask God to set the, 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 the schedule and the timetable. Or whatever words, forget it. So, so that you don't have to work. But your attitude, your attitude has got to be one that exemplifies the spirit of Christ. Come on, church. We have too many believers who have this rotten attitude. They talk to the supervisor anyway. It's called insubordination. And, and you're, you're not exuding that beautiful spirit of Christ. How can anybody want to come to your church? Why would they want to accept your Jesus? Am I preaching good? I mean, don't let me sweat up and wet up myself for nothing. <laughs> Somebody ought to lift your hand and say, guilty as charged, Bishop. 
Come on. If that's you, if you're not doing the best for Jesus, that you. Don't be afraid. I'm, this is not a game. Raise your hand and say, I'm guilty as charged. I, I could have invited somebody else to church today. I could have picked up somebody who needs a ride to come to church, but I just, I just didn't. I, I could be a better witness, but I just didn't. Hmm? Stand to your feet, everybody. Lift your hands and just worship God. Come all over this building. Lift your hands and worship God. I'm done. Next time we'll talk about overcoming the fear. Mm. I wonder 